morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right, great. Um, I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so just reviewing with you a little bit about implementation of the new version of the IRFPI, the 1.4. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some unique aspects or some changes from what we currently measure or what we currently um, assess. And then I'm going to introduce a tool that we feel will be really helpful for you as you uh, listen to the speakers over the next couple of days. And uh, we'll give you something very tangible to re return to your facilities and implement. So let's get started. So when we think about implementing the IRFPI, the 1.4 version, we're going to need to begin transmission of that beginning October 1st of 2016. So I saw a lot of experience in the room. I saw a lot of hands go up. And what that tells me is that you understand that if we're transmitting information or submitting information on discharges October 1st, that means that we're going to have to be looking at our patients that are in the facility prior to that. Some of the assessment items that we're going to review with you over the next couple of days really have um, implications uh, upon admission. So you're going to need to begin to think about, as you go back to your facilities, how you're going to make that transition. Think about you know, your average lengths of stay, the types of patients that you admit, and come up with a plan with your team to identify how you're going to make that transition. For us at the facility that I work at, we have decided that beginning September 1, we're going to begin to collect um, and assess the new items for all our admissions. We feel it's just a great way for us to start. We can get some practice in, and it will allow us the opportunity to be sure that come October 1st, um, we'll be ready. Our average length of stay for our facility tends to be about 14 days. So that's sort of, um, it gives us a buffer, depending upon what uh, your lengths of stay are, you may want to consider um, how you're going to do that. If you have a lot of patients that have longer lengths of stay, you may want to consider even starting sooner than that. It's important to keep in mind, which is not new, uh, but that uh, submission or transmission of, these, of the IRFPI 1.4 is required for those patients who have traditional Medicare or Medicare Part A, your Medicare Part C, the Advantage plans, so those are your managed Medicare. And also anybody with Medicare as a secondary that you think you may um, obtain reimbursement from Medicare for. And I know some facilities tend to transmit or submit all their Medicare secondaries just because they feel more comfortable doing that. And there's no change in that with the new version at all. One of the most important things I think you're going to want to do is determine which clinicians are going to be completing um, which items. Who in your team is going to be responsible for what? And I think that's one of the very first steps you might want to do when you get back. Or for those folks who are, you know, there's always those overachievers who have been doing this now for a month or two and have been planning, that you want to go back and make sure that you've done this um, to the degree in which it needs to be done. Can't emphasize enough that you'll want to start training as soon as possible. You know, one of the things that we did do um, at our facility, again, it's just an example, but we did identify which clinicians are going to be responsible for which items, and then we are going to do specific training for that end user group who are going to be doing those pieces. So while we're going to provide overall education for everyone in our facility, we're going to be very sure that we do very specific training to those folks that are going to be um, assessing those items. That way it feels a little less overwhelming when you start to do your training. Uh, we recommend, or I recommend, that you begin you know, your um, data collection as soon as possible. I don't know about you guys, but the best laid plans, you know, we think it's going to go well, and we're pretty sure, and we're confident, and, but something comes up, and something's different than we imagined it to happen. So it, it's a good idea if you start early, you have plenty of time to then sort of go back and sort of replan your, your uh, strategy a little bit. Some of the key differences in the items that were going to be added to the 1.4 version in comparison to the current items that we assess is that the data collection and the associated data collection instructions are different. And that's an important piece to know. The rating scales or the, um, the way in which we're going to score or code these items, that scale is different. And you need to, to identify that and, and recognize that. 
and the item definitions are different. So you're gonna really wanna spend some time looking item by item and make sure you understand what the definition is and that you are able to assess that item based on that new definition. One of the things that came up for us when we first started looking at the manual and, and, and planning for the future was we kept seeing the word code. And I don't know about you, I saw a lot of nurses, I'm a nurse too, um, when I hear the word code or coder, I'm thinking about that, you know, that medical records person that comes through when they read through the doctor's history and, and they assign an ICD-10 code or something. For the next couple of days, when we referred to the word code or coder, we're talking about the new items um, and the way that we're going to rate those items. And, and that'll become more clear as, you know, Ann speaks next and as the other speakers. So keep in mind that it's not that traditional coder that you're used to hearing. One of the things that we also did at the facility where I work that I think is really helpful personally is that we're used to scoring a certain um, set of items, right? We all know how to score the items that we currently do. And so the new items are gonna be coded. So we've sort of used those words as sort of our way of, de of determining the difference. So when I say to a clinician, are you talking about coding an item or are you talking about scoring an item? It's very clear to them that I've delineated the difference. It's just something we've done, thought I would throw it out there as, as a possibility for you as well. One of the things that we also do at our facility is every morning the patients, we still do breakfast trays. I don't know if people do that in the earth, but okay. So we still do that as well. And one of the things we always do is every morning our patients get a little sort of, you know, those tented um, cards on their breakfast tray. And just so that they have a thought of the day, something that will get them going. They've got a hard day of rehab ahead and we, we want them to be motivated to do so. And this was one of the tent cards that came up last week and um, our rec therapist stopped by my office and brought it in and said, I think you should use this in your talk next week. Um, and it is embrace change because true success can be de defined by the ability to adapt to changing circumstances. And I think we all know that there's a lot of change in healthcare, there's constant change, and our ability to adapt to it and embrace it really makes moving forward a lot easier. So what are some of the things that we can do um, when we go back to our facilities to really help create an environment of success? And I think one of the main things that we can do as leaders or people who are um, going to be implementing this is to really um, set the tone um, moving forward. In my opinion, the overall success of any project is directly correlated to the way it is presented and then ultimately received. So I think moving forward, we keep a positive attitude and a doable um, focus, um, this, this change can, can really be implemented well. My suggestion would also be to break it up into pieces. Sometimes when we look at something overall, it just feels bigger than life. But if you break it up into little pieces, and we did that by going item by item, it really felt a lot more doable and a lot more achievable. You're also gonna to wanna to recruit a lot of uh, key members um, for your team for implementation. This was the first thing we did, and my colleague is in the back, and she's a great planner. You gotta love her, she's gonna be talking later. And she plans everything. And the first thing she did was we set up a meeting with all the key people that we knew we needed in the room in order to make this change. And some of the people we included might not be the ones that you think of immediately. We included our pre-admission nurses. We included our IT people. Certainly therapy, nursing, um, our physicians, um, our qual I'm quality and I do case management as well. We included all those folks because we went item by item and we sat around the room and said, okay, so which clinician or which person could help us to assess this item so that it wasn't one group of people taking on um, a new set of items. And we were surprised how many things could be given to folks you might not think of. Our pre-admission nurses, we all know our pre-admission evaluations are pretty comprehensive, right? Um, I oversee the admission nurses, so I see what's done pre-admission. Just by changing the wording on some of our documents, we're able to then assess an item that otherwise would have been done later. For example, we always ask patients or look through their history and physical to see what their past medical history is and what their past surgical history is. One of the new items that you're gonna hear about is, has the patient had major surgery in the last 100 days? Well, that's a great pre-admission thing. So that's not an added piece for anyone back at the earth. It's just a way of fine-tuning that pre-admission assessment. 
So it's important to look, as I said, at the item definitions because you might be surprised how easy you can work them into what you're already doing. I think it's helpful also if staff understand and can help identify why are we doing this. I think we heard you know, earlier why from a big picture why this makes all kinds of sense. But in a, in a smaller way, how are you going to use it in your facility? And, and we identified a couple of very key discharge planning pieces that we're going to use. You know, the ability to get in and out of a car, for one, is a great one. We, we typically do that for a lot of our patients, but not necessarily on everyone. And one of our goals is to have the patient get to their primary care appointment seven days after discharge. So if I'm a case manager and that patient can't get in and out of their car, then I know I need to figure out some, some other form of transportation for them. So we help people to see how that's going to help. You want to practice, practice, and practice. The last thing I want to introduce, and it's probably the most important piece that they've asked me to do, and that is to introduce the whole idea of the action plan. You've all been given one, it's at your, it was in your handouts, and I can't emphasize enough how helpful this will be if you use it over the next couple of days. At the end of each of the speaker's talks, they're going to offer some suggestions on things you might want to look at and how you might want to move forward when you go back to your facility. And if you use this tool over the next couple of days and record after each speaker what those items are, you have an implementation plan the day you walk back in your facility. And we feel really strongly that this is a great tool for you to use. So there is an example in there. It goes over a little bit about one of the Section Bs. Um, it talks a little bit about documentation and what you might want to look at. So please take a few minutes at the end of each talk and utilize this tool. I, I really believe this is going to be really helpful. So I want to thank you for um, giving me this opportunity to come up and speak to you. I'm around for the next couple of days. If you have any questions or you want to share some of your ideas with me, I'd appreciate it. Definitely, I know the other speakers have talked about use your table. The intent of the tables this way was not um, by mistake. We, we definitely wanted people to sit around and talk and share ideas. Each of our IRFs or our IRUs are very different. We have different cultures. We have different types of staff. So what might work in a 60-bed freestanding IRF might not work in a 10-bed IRU. But let's talk about it and let's share ideas because there's other folks in this room that have facilities similar to yours. So thank you.